All right, talking tunes, and we're here with Mr. What is your name again? Don Anderson. <laughs> I think who, so. Who was that guy? I just stopped by to see if you have any toilet paper this morning. <laughs> <I> just... <laughs> so, Don Anderson, if, if, if anybody doesn't know by the by now, it's one of the biggest names in radio ever in Mesquite that history. Is, that is so overblown. <laughs> I mean, <laughs> you know, Oscar, I was thinking about that. I was only on the air in Muskegon for about uh, let's see, sixty to sixty-seven or thereabouts. So that's that was my my so, tenure as far as a regular afternoon slot or any slot. True was a relatively short stint. Afternoon drive was from sixty-three until sixty-seven. Prior to that, I wrote commercials and did fill-in. And before that, I was at MUS. CBQ, which is LRC, the tower is still outside uh, the door, I think. Okay, now MUS, that was before the country and everything else came about. It was, I started there in the fall of 62, and a month or two later, I had the privilege and honor and distinction of being the first person to talk on WMUS-FM. No one knows that because no one was listening. Right, right. Um, but yeah, that was we signed that on, and yeah, FM and, was uh, kind of a strange thing it, back then. It was. It was very strange. Yeah. But I stayed there for oh about six months, and then an opening came at True to write copy. A fellow by the name of Chuck Rich, who ended up leaving True to form his own station, ZND in Zealand, I think were the calls. I wrote copy for a year, and then Ron Tyndall left True. I got into the copywriting because I had been working at True part-time in high school. Oh, okay. And I had worked at True off and on filling in uh, for probably a year or two. I'd go back to True, and then I'd go to a station, then I'd go back to True. and um, But an opening came up, and they said, hey, would you like uh, to come and write copy? I said, yeah, absolutely. Uh, Mike Boonstra and Charlie Boonstra weren't too happy with me. Bunker Rogoski, I think, threw me out the door when I told <laughs> them. I, no, I'm kidding. Uh, I told them I was leaving to go to True. His words were, we're a family here. I said, yeah, but you got coal on your hands. I, <laughs> no, they were, they were great people. They really were. Um, but I went to True. That's what I always love about what? you, man. You're direct and honest. That's what I love about you. Yeah. <laughs> uh, that's you what my wife says. You speak the truth. You speak um, the truth. I wrote copy for a year and then did part-time as well. One of the neatest part-time gigs I ever did was substituting a GRD, our sister station. WTRU was owned by regional broadcasters. Okay. And WGRD was our sister station in Grand Rapids. And I think it was the summer of 62. But I got to uh, fill in for uh, the jocks over at GRD. That was Bill Merchant in the morning, Bob Yashu Whitcomb in the uh, midday, and Skip Bell afternoon. Oh. And that was it because GRD was a daytimer. He used that name on the radio? Who? Yashu. Yashu. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Yashu was the polka king of Grand Rapids. Ah, okay. Oh, yeah, yeah. He was on. And then I would engineer. In fact, I got a picture somewhere in the back of my head engineering for uh, Bob on his polka show. Uh, up at the White House on the Hill, 50, whatever it was on Lafayette. Oh, oh there's something to get up for right there. <laughs> <laughs> sure. <laughs> but um, I filled in for the GRD jocks that summer, um, came back, worked at McDonald's from whatever time I could get back, usually about 10, 30, 11 o'clock, McDonald's on Sherman. And then I would leave early at 5.30 to go out to True to substitute for Jack Leroy, Jack Majeski, now, Jack so, Majeski was on the air. Oh for a yeah, while? Oh, Jack okay. Leroy. Yeah, you didn't know that? No, mm, no sure. I didn't. Jack's a great guy. Yeah. Uh, I haven't seen him for a number of years, but I'm looking forward to catching up with him soon. Yeah. Mike Majeski, of course, is one of the premier engineers right. in this whole part of the state. And, and Mike, and, I, Mike, I know well. But Mike, yeah. Jack's son. Jack was Jack Leroy, a very good announcer. But the reason that he was on True and the reason he got the job was because he was a first phone, had a first class ticket. And True being directional had to have somebody on duty all times uh, when they were in the directional array. Uh, so anyway, I did, that was a wild summer. And then middays I would do McDonald's. And then I came back and, and sat in for Jack until midnight and then started the whole thing over again about 4 o'clock in the morning driving to Grand Rapids for Bill or middays and so forth uh, uh, for the jocks over there. That was, that was fun. Yeah. Now, what, what is this thing you used to do as far as the, the dance party that you used to, used to? Oh, the Grand Haven Beach Bash. Beach Bash, okay. Skip Knight and I started the Beach Bash in the uh, 
it was concurrent with me going full time or afternoon drive. I had been full time uh, writing copy, but um, Skip set up an arrangement with the Grand Haven Roller Rink, where the proceeds from running the dances would go a third to the roller rink, a third to the station, and then Skip and I would split the other third. That was a sixth apiece, I think. <laughs> paid for paid for our, the down payment on our house in uh, Grand Haven years wow. later. I do remember that. Wow. Um, it was a very, very successful venture. We had we didn't have the ventures, but we had just about everybody else. We had you know the big acts out of Detroit. We would run on Wednesday and Saturday nights in the summer, and then just Saturday nights in the uh, winter time. Um, but we had everybody. The Detroit groups were clamoring to come over and do the bash because they got all the exposure of GRD and Grand Rapids. We would run spots concurrent with uh, the spots that ran on True, and they were they would call us i did the booking and they would call me and say hey we got this act we got this and that's how we got a lot of our acts acts like sro i don't know if you ever heard of it no the detroit group did you ever hear of mitch Ryder? oh yeah <laughs> of course you did <laughs> yeah I've ta- i actually talked to mitch at one I time i think i remember yeah. you mentioning it yeah. yeah uh we had mitch Ryder. uh we had alice cooper when he was just starting out wow yeah. Wild, wild show. I mean, he was. De- it was kind of neat. I think back. I didn't realize at the time. I thought this guy is going nowhere. He'd do these crazy <laughs> things on stage, and I thought this is a flash in the pan for sure. Yeah. And look what he uh, ends up doing. But Still he was doing it at seventy years old. Oh yeah. my word! He was just just nuts. We had this tiny little stage. Couldn't have been more than uh, 15, 20 feet wide, and you know, probably that deep. Um, that these acts would go up on, and, and I was afraid that he was going to fall off uh, any corner any time. <laughs> but we had the big acts of, uh, of the day, Tommy James, Paul and Paula, Dick and Dee Dee. Uh, all these acts would come in. Some of them brought their own bands, had their, their own band. Others, we'd have to go out and get a house band. And some of them would sing uh, along with the record. They would just lip sync it. Right. There was a fella on the air by the name of Bob Klein. He did Middays of True when I was doing Afternoon Drive. Bob and I uh, arranged this routine for Sonny and Cher's You Got Me, Babe, <laughs> where I played the part of Sonny. Bob was a much heftier guy than Skinny Mini Me. Uh, Handy Andy the Slim Slender one is one of the things I used on the air. Of course, nobody could see me because, as you know, ugly or, or uh, guys that don't look very good get on the radio because yeah, they don't yeah, want to yeah, be yeah, seen. Yeah, yeah. 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 So he was he played the part of Cher and I was Sonny. I had on Sonny's wild sport coat and he had on the dress and the whole thing. We got to the end of the record. You know where the the pause is where it says you got me babe yeah. and then there's a pause and yeah. then the instrumental comes back in. Bum, 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 bum. Well, Skip Knight was running the record player. He didn't realize there was a pause there. So when the pause came, we're going into the latter part of our routine and he picks the needle off the record. <laughs> <laughs> we said Put it back on. Put it back. So he puts it back on. And the last part of it was Bob picked me up in his arms and we sang the last chorus or lip synced the last chorus. And then he let me down and we both took a bow. And on his bloomers that he wore, he flipped his dress up and my wife had embroidered on there applause, please. Oh, okay. Uh, you know, stupid little things like that. But the, the, Kids that we, we had at the dance just loved that stuff. It was yeah. just, and we'd do a, whatever we thought of something stupid like that. You know, we'd come come and do it. Now, a lot of the announcers that uh, up to uh, yesterday also were part of your program too. Like I remember Tim. It wasn't Tim Ackerhoff part of that too, or I gave Tim his first radio gig. I did class break with uh, a gal by the name of Marquita Ecker. Marquita went to Muskegon Heights. I went to Muskegon, but. She uh, had this show on, and I don't remember who she was doing it with before me, but she called up and she said, I need somebody to do a class break with. And she knew that I was hanging around true and, you know, becoming yeah. a pest, generally speaking. And she said, would you want to do I said, sure. So we Saturday mornings, we would read class news from the various high schools. Okay. Um, when I, I had been long gone from class break, but because I had gone full-time into radio, um, we needed somebody at True to do the show. Tim had been hanging around, bugging the daylights out of everybody. So I said, look, t- I'm just kidding. I said, <laughs> no, you're not. <laughs> I said, Tim, we've got this, this show on Saturday mornings. And I told him, what he said, oh, I know. I listen to it all the time. I said, how would you like to be the guy, the male portion of the two-person uh, team? He said, sure, love to. 
At that time, we renamed it, if you remember doing the interview that uh, I watched when you and Tim were talking, we called it Class Break A Go-Go. Oh, yeah, yeah. Because by then, a go-go, you know, the go-go stuff had come into to being, and we renamed it. But So Tim was on that, and uh, I think that's one of the, could be one of the first things that he did in radio. So yeah. anyway, yeah. lots of people through the years. Did uh, Was that Fred Pat Tascone that hired you over there, or was that? I was hired first by Skip Knight. Skip was the program director. Okay. And I was at MUS. I had done class break. And got a call, and Skip said, we've got um, this opening for a copywriter. He said, Fred would like to talk to you. So I came in and uh, talked to Fred, and he hired me. Fred was the, he was the, probably, I know you always ask people who who was important in somebody's career. Fred right. was that guy for me. Okay. Uh, he hired me at True. He hired me at GRD. He never fired me, which was kind of nice. <laughs> but uh, I, I owe so much to Fred Tascone, and so do many, many people right. uh, in the area. Uh, he probably fired a few people, too, but uh, I'm sure. <laughs> you? <laughs> oh, yeah, twice. <laughs> well, that's the nature of the business. Uh, <laughs> things happen. In fact, we had a WGRD reunion back in 2010 at the uh, Hilton over in Grand Rapids. And somebody stood up and said, who all has been fired in this room? I don't think there was a single person in radio, and they were all in radio except for the wives, uh, who hadn't been fired. Right. We yeah. all stood up and said, yeah, me, me, me. Yeah. I got fired from CBQ when it was uh, CBQ before LRC. Now, was this firing, though, because of programming changes? Or oh, no. Not did- mine. No. Oh. <laughs> so it wasn't me. It was a program change is what they did. No, no. I there were various reasons. I I clashed with the owner of the yeah. the son's owner. Yeah, I've never clashed CBQ. with anybody. <laughs> <laughs> never. Well, he was always late for his shift at CBQ, the the Whitehall station, and I got tired of it. So one day, I waited for his car to drive in the country road that the station was located on, which is right out somewhere close to here, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. it is. Yeah. And uh I waited for for his car that I could see, you know, hundreds of yards down. Right. And I had a record on the turntable, so I got in my car, car, drove out, rolled down the window, and said, hey, your record's about to end. You're late. Goodbye. That didn't go over very well. <laughs> <laughs> so, but I was, what, 18, 19 years old at the time. Now, is this 95.3, the frequency you were at? Or no, no, this? no. This is uh, 1490. Oh, 1490. 14, okay, no, right. no, no. This is way before. Okay. All right. Uh, this is 1490 this WCBQ. Is okay. This is I'm AM, sorry. right. I forgot we used to, uh, Sunday afternoons, I ran all, I, I would go to work at 5, 6 o'clock in the morning. It was a day timer. Right. And sign it off, sign it on, sign it off. The afternoon, we had nothing but church services. Oh, okay. So I would bring my twenty two rifle and a bunch of cans and the railroad tracks that ran behind the station, I would use as a backdrop. Right. As, as something to stop the shells, and I would shoot tin cans all afternoon listening for the tape to end. You know, stupid things like that. Okay. Now, 1490, uh, isn't that that one that's right next door to me? Mm-hmm. Okay. Mm-hmm. Yeah, the railroad track used to be there. Now it's a, yeah, it's gone. Now it's a just, bike trail. Just a berm. <laughs> In fact, the first time I was out here, your place, I went through the old station, and I still saw some of the things we wrote on the wall in the sales really? office. Really? Yeah, good things about, you know, there's a, here's a, a client to see, or here's a package we want to sell or something. Yeah, see, that was the first radio station <laughs> I ever worked at. Mm-hmm. It was 1490, mm-hmm. but it was WPBK then. And um, that building, uh, that equipment, because that was the first job I had as far as in radio because I worked, um, I, I got the job to fix cart machines, which were 110 years old at that time when I went in there to do them. I mean, you remember the old cart machines. I mean, the really old cart machines with the, the big metal handle you pulled back when you put the cart in. I remember them, but when I worked at CBQ... Uh, this was before cart machines. Yeah, okay, yeah. <laughs> we had no, t- I don't think we had any What you do, burn commercials on record or what? <laughs> no, we read them all live. No, we oh, okay, no, I all take, right. I, I'm take that, I take that back because I remember recording a commercial. And at this point, I'm at community college, and I hadn't really decided this was going to be what I wanted to do for the rest of my life. Right. And I remember recording a commercial. It had a, a music bed. It had an open and a close, and I had to put the insert in. And I remember being so excited going home and telling my folks, I've just decided what I want to do. 
Yeah. I think they threw me out of the house at that point and said, <laughs> you know, you're on your own, kid. Yeah. <laughs> but that was, um, and we had some kind of a, maybe it was a cart machine, an early cart machine. I don't remember that. They were pretty old anyway. I remember, well, I remember the turntables <laughs> were so old that, you know, you, with turntables, you keep buying a new cartridge or a new, uh, new needle for them, and you can keep going with those. But those were very old, too. They, were, they weighed, like, I don't know, 150 pounds oh, yeah. a piece, you know. Great boat anchors. Oh, yeah. Yeah, yeah but, you know, the, the magnetic turntables, they were perfect for queuing records and all that good stuff. So, Now, were you a, were you a pro at that as far as queuing records? And uh, now, did you program your own format for WTRU, or was that programmed for you? Uh, no, we did our own format. Okay. You know, it was all done in-house. Um, as far as queuing a record, the person that taught me how to queue records was Ray Hozier, okay. who a lot of people will remember either from radio or from television because he did a lot of television for Channel 13. I okay, used to I substitute for him. Right. Uh, he did the drop-ins or the, the cut-ins from Muskegon, from Muskegon News, from Channel 13, from the old Occidental Hotel. And I did a couple of those, uh, which I, I still regret to this day because my wife reminds me about it once in a while and said, you, you need to stick to radio. It was, <laughs> it was pretty bad. And I won't go into any more detail on that. Um, but Ray taught me how he did a Sunday morning show on True called The Sound of Music, where they would play these long, you know, beautiful music LPs, this yeah. type of thing. But he taught me how to cue a record, taught me how to open the mic switch, taught me some production techniques and... I was off and running. So he's the one that kind of taught you, and it, because there's a lot of people that mentioned, like Bob Moore and Tim Akterhoff, both mentioned that you were the one that kind of taught them how to how to do the editing and, and, and working with a lot yep. of the different things. Ray was the one that, uh, he was, uh, next to Fred Tascone, was probably as instrumental as I can remember in, in uh, getting me into radio and fostering that, uh, that, uh, that lo love of the business as it yeah. became. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, mine was in KBZ. I think his name was Dave Robinson. I think it was Robin. Uh, Matt Shepard was one of our afternoon news anchors at our station in South Haven. Matt came to us from Central Michigan University um, and then was hired by or one of the Detroit stations, hired him, and he ended up going to into television with Fox. And uh, it's, it's kind of neat to see these people that, that, you know, you worked with you, that you maybe hired, that maybe you had, you know, you taught them how to cue a record or something. And uh, then they go on to much bigger and better things than you ever thought possible. But right. that's, that's, there's a lot of uh, enjoyment in seeing that. I watch Matt every time and think about uh, the days when he worked with us. Yeah, yeah. And then, you know, people like, um, you wouldn't recognize the name from listening to Grand Rapids Radio, China Smith. China Smith was... Wayne Thomas doing afternoon drive at WGRD in probably 67, 68 when I was program director over there. And he went on to KHJ in Los Angeles, KCWQ, or some, some stations, several stations out in the LA area. Uh, San Diego, he went to, uh, he came back at one point in his career and was nighttime jock from like six to midnight on WODJ out of Grand Rapids. Okay. I'd call him up, we'd talk, and, uh, uh, remember the old times at GRD and a heck of a talent, Thomas Rohrbacher. He wouldn't mind me giving his real name, I'm sure. He passed down a number of years ago. Well, what is he going to say if he passed down a number of years ago? I mean, come on. <laughs> That's what I said. He wouldn't yeah, he mind. Yeah, he wouldn't mind. Yeah, okay. Now, <laughs> you, now as far as tr True goes, what, what was your, your, uh, your time slot? I mean, were you mornings? Were you nights? No, no, what? afternoon drive. Afternoon, afternoon drive. drive. Yep. Okay. Two to six. Okay, now when you went from True, how did you go? What did you, what did you go next uh, to Grand Rapids? Well, I I left. There came a time when I knew I couldn't go into that tiny little control booth anymore. I I just I had decided that I didn't want to continue in announcing. Okay, because I was married at the time. We had our first child, and even though I'd had an opportunity to go to WKMI in Kalamazoo. Uh, and about a month later, WOKY, Walkie in Milwaukee, called and said, we got this slot open for you. I said, oh, my, Walkie, wow. <laughs> about three years earlier, I would have probably jumped at it, but yeah. I had this realization that I didn't want to go chasing that golden microphone all over the country, as so many people do, and, and do very well doing it. It just wasn't me. I, I was more of a homebody, I guess. I wanted to put down roots. Uh, so I decided that it wasn't for me to stay on the air. Fred came and said uh, one day, 
I need a program director in Grand Rapids. He was general manager of TRU as well as GRD. And uh, I said, yeah, fine, I'd love to do it. So we bought a house in Grand Haven as opposed to the house we were renting in Muskegon. We've been married, I think, maybe two years. And moved to Grand Haven because he said, I'm still going to need a lot of things out of you here in, in Muskegon. I still want you to do some programming here, do some voices, whatever it may have been. Right. Uh, music selection, that type of thing. Um, so we moved to Grand Haven, long story short, because it was in between. You know, I could go down to, what is that, Lake Michigan Drive, was about 10 minutes from the house, and beat it into Grand Rapids. Um, I was at GRD for two years, uh, program director. And at that point, I saw that, you know what, the real money in the business, as far as I could see, was not necessarily on the air, unless you were somebody that went on to a Los Angeles or a Chicago. That just wasn't me. Number one, I didn't have the confidence that I could do it. Number two, I didn't want to do it. And as I say, I saw that sales and uh, administration was probably where the, the real money in the business was. So I went to Fred one day and said, you know, if anything ever opens up over at True, I'm doing program director in uh, Grand Rapids, I'd like to take a shot at that. He came to me one day and said, uh, Tom Shine, who was a sales rep, uh, at True, and I could talk about Tom, Tom for probably 15 minutes. Uh, he's pretty well known in the Grand Haven, uh, Muskegon area. He had been transferred to True's sister station in Syracuse, New York, WOLF. Tom was transferred to WOLF in Syracuse, New York as general manager, so that opened up a sales spot in Muskegon. And I jumped. I said, I want to do sales. You know, besides not wanting to necessarily be on the air anymore and travel all over changing stations and so forth, one of the underlying reasons that I wanted to go into sales was I got to wear a suit and tie every really? day. Yeah. Wow. Can you imagine anything so no. dumb? Yeah, I know. <laughs> but I remember walking out of the house and, man, I, this is great. <laughs> that lasted probably four or five weeks. Mm, <laughs> and then I said, what have I done? But I enjoyed it. I, was, I sold in the uh, Muskegon area, Muskegon and Grand Haven, Whitehall, for two years. And then here comes Fred again. He calls one Saturday morning, I'll never forget, Arlene and I are in our house in Grand Haven. Fred calls and said, uh, I've got something I want to talk to you about. What's the story? He said, I would like you to go uh, to Grand Rapids as general manager of WGRD. You know, what? Yeah. I mean, what? GRD had just become um, a full-time FM AM uh, operation hmm, probably three or four months prior to this. This was April of... Uh, 71. Okay. And I said, let me get back to you. We talked it over, and Arlene said, you know, whatever. I'm in it for the long haul. I called Fred up, and I said, uh, yeah, I want to do it. So um, April, latter part of April, uh, I picked up, went to GRD in Grand Rapids, and was general manager. And it was the, it was one of the best decades of my life because I, I was there from 71 until uh, 81. One of the things in the regional group that they – uh, adhered to as far as promotion of people. If you wanted to manage a station, they looked for people who had been announcers. Mm -hmm. And then they looked for people who had been announcers and salesmen, sales reps. Right. Um, because we understood, and I say we because I happen to come out of that, that school of thought, we understood what it takes to be on the air. We understood the... Uh, the problems that salespeople had when they're out selling. Right. And we could take and run the station based on those two facets. I mean, was, besides engineering, there's not a whole lot, le uh, not a whole lot else. It's what time is it? I'm getting. <laughs> <laughs> is it nap time? <laughs> it must be nap time. <laughs> um, there's, there are so many things that happen to announcers. So many things that happen to sales reps that somebody coming out of, let's say, bookkeeping or accounting and put into a, a GM spot, it's done a lot now. It's done way too much as far as I'm concerned because they don't understand the, the trials and tribulations of the people who are coming up through the ranks and who are actually running the station, right. running the programming. They, they don't understand or they, they wouldn't have no comprehension that the announcers at WGRD-FM, when we made the switch from the 12 by 60 mobile home where the where the the offices were located at Plymouth and Leonard in Grand Rapids when we made the switch from the transmitter building that was next door 
to the, uh, the, the mobile home. This is how the station ran when I arrived in 1971. Okay. Bookkeeping, sales, run out of the mobile home. The announcers were out in the transmitter shack. By shack, I'm talking about open ceilings. Wow, really? Uh, uh, <clears throat> it was so bad that there was a light, light bulb that literally hung down to light up their, their cards in front of them, <laughs> their promos, wow. their liners. And the biggest thing is the first guy that was going to read a liner and went, <gasps> and, you know, to get a breath of air, swallowed a bug. <laughs> And had to be taken off. You know, somebody had to come in the rest of the night because the poor guy couldn't talk. It was that bad. <laughs> Must it have was, been a big bug. <laughs> it was a pretty good-sized bug, I guess. I, guess, I can't remember yeah. who it was. There was another thing. They put a sign on the bathroom in this transmitter shack where this this 50,000-watt station was trying to become well-known in Grand Rapids. They put a sign on the bathroom. It said, please don't flush while the announcer is talking. <laughs> Of course, everybody did it on purpose. Yeah. The guy would be doing a WGRD, first in Grand Rat. You know, he'd be doing his liner, and they <laughs> <laughs> just to see if they could rattle him. Yeah. You know, it's just like lighting the news copy of uh, the newsman uh, when he's trying to do the news story. Well, you were talking about Majeski earlier. Mike Majeski, he used to do when I worked at Rock 95, which is a station <clears throat> here in, in Whitehall area. And anyway, he used to do that all the time. He, he when he'd engineer, I did the overnights. When he'd engineer, he'd always come in in the overnights to do his work because nobody, he's you know, according to him, nobody listens in the overnights. So anyway, he uh, come in and he would do do stuff like that and and just try to do whatever he could to possibly make me, you know, screw up. And I was brand new, mm -hmm. so I thought, man, this is just horrible. Why would you do this to this guy that's just trying to be on the radio yep. and? Yep. You know, now it's like I do it myself. You know, it's a lot of fun to, to try to rattle somebody. It's hard to do it these days. Mm -hmm. And I just fell asleep. I don't know about you. But. <laughs> WGRD FM came into being. It was really a religious experience. And I don't say I say that somewhat tongue tongue in cheek, but. Being a Roman Catholic, Fred got to know Father Michael Bayan and the people in the Grand Rapids Diocese, Catholic Diocese. The Grand Rapids Catholic Diocese had a radio station, WXTO-FM, that had a transmitter and tower on top of Aquinas College. Hmm. They got into trouble with financially uh, with the FM station because, as Father Mike would tell us later, we were pretty good at religion, but we don't know a thing about this radio business. You know, it just it wasn't what they wanted to do. And knowing Fred, he said something, and I, I'm speculating, he said, can you help us out? Do you know anybody that would like to have this station? Ah, light bulb must have gone off in Tascone's head because they worked it out where GRD, where regional broadcasters, I should say, bought uh, the station. Lock, Stock, and Tower. Regional broadcasters bought WXTO-FM. We took and moved the tower. They moved it. I wasn't involved in that at this point. Moved it out to Plymouth and Leonard, where the AM station was located, built a new tower. Because the little old tower on XTO, I don't think you could get it probably uh, outside of the Heritage Hill District uh, in Grand Rapids. So when I say a religious experience, that was the connection. That's the reason that WGRD-FM came into being was because of Fred's association with uh, Catholic Church. the Catholic Church in Grand Rapids. Yeah. Huh. I never knew that. Mm -hmm. we, were, we were as tight a Drake Top 40 format okay. as there ever was. We played 30 records for our playlist. And of those 30, um, the power rotation probably, and I don't know, I can't remember how Ron had it set up, but there were probably 10 records that were rotated throughout the primary day parts of the day. Okay. The primary day parts of the day. It doesn't make sense. Yeah, um, I know what you're saying. And then, of course, we had the solid gold. We had the oldies that would be interspersed. But right. it, was a, it was a type of rotation that people complain about if, they ha if there's a record they don't like. Geez, you guys play that record every yeah. hour. Yeah. Well, yeah. that's right. We just about play it every hour. Yeah. And the theory behind that is people want to hear the songs that uh, are the hot ones and the right. songs they like. Right. And that's what LAV wasn't doing at the time. Now, that's WLAV-AM that we were competing against right. primarily. Right. right. Um, 
the FM station was the one that had the signal and so forth, so that became our primary competitor. Right. We literally wiped LAV AM off the map. I don't know what they went to. I don't know how long they stayed with the top 40 format. They, they could not compete. wasn't that we were so great. It's just we had the signal 24 hours a day, and people could hear us you know, all over West Michigan. Well, they did a lot of different things. I, I, I used to listen to them. Like I say, the, the King, King Biscuit Flower Hour, it was called. I think. Okay. And they'd have like live live bands. Like I remember Heart and Genesis and stuff like that. They would have them actually in concert, uh, you know, on the on the radio. And they had like album rock where they played the whole album. Right. Classic yeah, they, album. Yeah, it's kind of something that we did later at Sunny FM too. But um, they may still be doing that today. I couldn't tell you what LED yeah, I don't is know doing. Either I couldn't tell you what GRD is. Somebody told me. I I happened to mention I ran into somebody and and they knew I had worked at GRD and I I said yeah we had a kick you know what format and they say they still do they're still doing very well i yeah. haven't i'm so far removed from i know, I know. broadcasting <laughs> this <laughs> is know. as close as i've been in 15 years i guess except for the little <laughs> studio i set up in the house well i'm the i'm the and rock you. and roller that uh, these days is listening to uh, floyd kramer i mean come on <laughs> sure last date <laughs> yeah but um the, the curiosity about the the program directing now as far as that goes how did you lay out your format? I just know it was all pretty tightly con- controlled. And, yeah. And um, it's what, what GRD was built on because people could tune in. They knew they were going to hear the best songs of the day. Right. They were going to have great promotions. In 78, 9, 80, I was working with like a $150,000 promotional budget. Yeah. That's a lot of money when you take what would it be today? You know, probably three, four hundred thousand right. for a uh, for a top forty rock and roll radio station. That was a lot. We gave away Corvettes, we gave away trips to every place on the globe. I think um, that was one of the the big features. One of the for, the forte of the format, along with the music, was the promotions that we did. Right now, <coughs> as far as MUS goes, too, that's a, Tim did it a lot. Oh yeah, he had too. a great yeah. great. And he he pretty much did that, you know, got those things arranged. Now, were, were you, is that your responsibility to do that, or did you have Mine, somebody else to do that? N- we, it was a uh, Ron and I, and Vince to a certain extent worked as 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 a trio, I guess, of people who, if I didn't have the idea, Ron did. If Ron didn't have it, maybe Vince did. But hmm. as far as the real promotion, I'm thinking back now, it was pretty much Ron and I came up with it, although Ron probably did 75% of it, and I maybe kicked in the rest of it. Ron was very in tune with, with what was going on around the country, uh, much more so than I was. And there, there's nothing new in radio. I mean, that was no, a statement yeah, way yeah. back then. Yeah, right. So if somebody in Memphis, Tennessee, or Little Rock, Arkansas, or Nome, Alaska, had a, a, a promotion that really worked, we'd hear about it. Right. And other people would hear about it, and then you'd refine it yeah. Oh, yeah. to your station. Yeah. Well, that's, you know, the, the, the one thing, too, is certain certain stations that are owned, you know, that own many stations, you'll go, you know, down the state and you'll hear that other station, but it sounds just like mm-hmm. the station back mm-hmm. in your hometown mm-hmm. because they pretty much format them the same, use the same liner guy, sure. use everything. So you how did you come about buying your own station? What, what, what brought that on? That was always my goal. Um, first, my goal was when I was in sales and and, uh, pr- and programming was to was to manage my own station. Um, Fred was a great manager, but there were things that he did that I disagreed with, things that I would have done differently had it been you know my decision or my station. Um, the other managers that I worked for, you know, basically by and large did a good job, but I could see I don't care for the way he handled this situation or you know what I'm talking about. Just difference in people, I guess someday I'm going to manage my own radio station and I'm going to do it the way I want to do it and the way I think it should be done. Same thing applied to someday I'm going to own my own station and I don't answer to anybody. I just do what I want to do. What a fallacy that was. I know, right? (laughs) Oh my word. Cause you answer to the bank. Everybody. Yeah. yeah. (laughs) I mean, you got, you got that big banker standing there saying, hmm, as long as you're making money and pay your, you know, your mortgage, yeah. uh, you're okay. Um, but that, I, I got to the point with, with regional broadcasters where I was managing GRD, GRD uh, but I was also in charge of the chain, 
we had stations in from Titusville, Florida, to Syracuse, New York, to Binghamton, New York, Youngstown, Ohio, Meadville, Pennsylvania, Sharon, Pennsylvania, and I'm sure I'm leaving some out. Binghamton, New York. I don't know if I mentioned that one. Um, I would spend a week at GRD. I would spend another week on the road at one of the stations, hmm. going in and seeing what's going on. You got problems? How's your format? You know, all these different things. Uh, getting sales forecasts. The third week in many months, not every month, but many months, I would spend in D.C. with our FCC attorneys because you can imagine the, the, all the stuff that goes on. We want to tweak our power. We want to put our tower up. We want to do this. We want to do that. And then we'd spend so much time on regulations. You can't do that, Anderson, because the FCC will take your license away, you know, that type of thing. Yeah. Uh, so I was constantly gone. You know, my wife will tell you, yeah, I remember those days he was kind of like an absentee father at times. And I got tired of that real quick. I did it for about a year and a half, two years, as I recall. And I finally, at one point, said, um, that's enough. And I'm going to have my own station. And I filed an application for the FM station in South Haven, Michigan, that had never been built. It was a construction permit that had been issued by the FCC, and nobody seemed to pay attention to it for quite some time because mm. South Haven was a tiny little town. Right. Um, but I saw it as a, a mini Traverse City on a much, much smaller level because Traverse City is a fantastic yeah. market, radio market, TV right. market, big market. South Haven was this little miniature of that. They had the lake. Uh, they had a booming retail business, uh, just a great place to live. So we decided to apply for the station. I, I could, Oscar, I could go into, it would take me an hour just to tell you about all the ins and outs, how we actually got this radio station. Uh, but it came down to, we got the construction permit against another guy that had the AM station in South Haven. We got it because... He had an existing station. Back then, you could only own seven radio or television combined stations. Right. You know, you could have three uh, AMs and three FMs or a TV and whatever made seven, as I recall back then. And we got the big points because we didn't have any radio station broadcast interest whatsoever. I take that back. I had 5% of WAAL in Binghamton that regional had given to me as a stock option type bonus situation, but I was 5% owner. Um, when it came time to put the station on the air, see, I'd have, I'm digressing now so far. This, this is not going to make a lot of sense. Um, I left GRD. I was fired from GRD in January of 1981. Did you know that? No. Oh, okay. No. And, well, when I told you about the people that stood up at our reunion, everybody stood up. I was one of them. Regional found out that I had an application in for the FM station. Oh, okay. Mm -hmm. yeah, I that didn't tell them, of course. That would do and it. they didn't really care for having, uh, having one of their managers or the guy running the group with his own application in, in, the, in WGRD's ADI or TSA or whatever you want to uh, break it down to. And I knew it was coming. I didn't know when, but I got a, a letter in the mail one day. We'd like your resignation. I said, okay, here we go. And we just stepped things up a little bit by we, Arlene and I, uh, decided that, okay, we're going to build this station in South Haven. We didn't even have the construction permit at the time, hmm. but you know, we knew we had a pretty good chance of getting it. Uh, January of 81, I left, and Ron White was also let go the same month. Other reasons, a bean counter came in in charge of the chain. Ed Bernstein, the fellow who had run the chain for many, many years, was unceremoniously booted out. I don't know to this day exactly all the reasons, but uh, he was gone. I was let go. Ron White was let go. That was a cost-saving measure, I think, because Ron was yeah. one of the higher-paid people in, in the chain. But anyway, um, we didn't know we were going to get the construction permit. I left GRD in January of uh, '81. Between January of 1981 and October 31st of 1981, the day we signed the new FM on, I had to come up with the money to build the radio station. We had to sell our house north of Grand Rapids that we had bought. We had to 
get the kids registered in another school. We took them to East Grand Rapids. We got the construction permit after we'd been there 30 days. Now we had to move to South Haven, find a house. We had the construction permit in hand, but we didn't have any land to build a tower. We had nothing. One of the the best things that, that uh, we did uh, is we bought the existing South Haven AM station. I could tell you stories about that station, but in a nutshell, the call letters were WJOR. The local people refer to it as the worst junk on radio. <laughs> Honest, true story. When we came in, the town of South Haven and all the little towns around were so happy to get a local radio station, it was fairly easy. I mean, it, it really... They welcomed us with open arms. So we bought the AM station. We combined it with the FM. Well, what that did was we didn't have to build studios. Right. We used the AM st- uh, station studios, right. which were terrible. <laughs> it was just, I mean, in an old building on Main Street on Phoenix Road in downtown South Haven, but it was just, just a crummy building. But it worked. We were able to take their existing production facility, which was all mono, we were able to take their ex- existing control room. Short story, my one claim to engineering is this story. We had a, a Spartan, I think it was a Sparta board. I don't know. If there, is there such a thing as a Sparta board? I think Probably, that's but what I, I have, remember. I haven't heard of it. But okay, yeah, maybe, well, I yeah. think that's what we had. It was about yay big. It had maybe six or eight slide pots. Yeah. It was all mono. So John Seymour, that's who's another story. John helped us get the station on the air. John's well known in engineering all over the Midwest. Uh, terrific guy, who you can never find unless it was an emergency. But that's a whole other story. Just, <laughs> <laughs> he, just engineers sometimes are like that. And I'm sorry, Mike and Jack and 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 the, the people I know in engineering. And I looked at Seymour one afternoon. We're trying to figure out what are we going to do for a control board. We didn't have the money to buy it. You know they were. I don't know, $10,000, something back then, eight. And I looked at that, and I said, well, we got all these these slide pots. I never worked with a slide pot. I was all on the, the, turn you know, pot, the, yeah. the rotary pots. Yeah. And I said, look it, we got two over here. You got a left channel. You got a right channel. Can't you take the right channel wire <laughs> and put it on that slide pot on the right and take the left channel wire, put it on that, Yeah. and then the, the announcer can take and hold both of them at the same time? Right, right. He said, that's the damnedest thing I ever heard. <laughs> and that's what he did. Yeah. I'm sure not quite that simplistically, but that's how we, and we used that from 1981 until 1987 when we built our new studios. Yeah, We had that station, uh, we owned it, uh, owner, operator, 100% of it. It was uh, something that... Uh, frankly, I don't think we could ever do, but it worked. And now you had a winery or something too, didn't you? Oh, that's a whole other story. That's yeah. a whole other story. When we okay. built the new, st- in a nutshell, we built the new studios, and Joe Borello, who is a was a sales manager, sales rep, or something at Wood, uh, Wood AM and FM, got to talking with him one afternoon about what we were doing and so forth. And I said, we got this big sixty five hundred square foot building that we just bought to put the new st- studios in. Right. I said, I got room that I don't know what to do with it. He said, why don't you open up a winery? What? Joe was very good friends with the people who owned Fen Valley Winery in Fenville. In those days, and I don't know, this is what, 30 years ago, 25? I don't know if you still do it, can do it today, but you could get a winery license, and as long as you made 5 or 10 gallons or some such number of wine a year, you could keep this license in effect. And because of an agreement that we signed between Fen Valley and Cozy Broadcasting, our corporation, um, we could sample their wine. Hi, welcome to Cozy 98 FM and AM radio and to Cozy's Fen Valley Wine Cellar and Tasting Room. I'm Don Anderson. This is my wife, Arlene. We're the owners of Cozy Radio and Cozy's Wine Cellar. And we're happy you've chosen to visit us here at Cozy. You may be here on a day when the radio station activity is somewhat limited. For instance, a Saturday or Sunday afternoon. This brief video tour will give you an idea of what happens during the week, especially during the Cozy morning hours, our busiest times. And thanks again for coming. We hope you'll come back often. Cozy Radio has been on the air serving Southwest Michigan since the fall of 1981. 
Our present broadcast studios were constructed over the winter of 1986 and 87 and included a total remodeling of a building built back at the turn of the century. Cozy's studios are considered one of the Midwest's most modern, state-of-the-art broadcast facilities. Each morning, Monday through Saturday, Cozy's three-man morning broadcast team brings Southwest Michigan the most complete news, weather, and sports available in the area. Our morning crew is led by Joe Jason, Cozy's Vice President of Operations. Time for sports on Cozy Tigers. Joe's our resident expert on sports. Tigers up by a half game over New York and Milwaukee in the American League East. Cleveland over Chicago 8-1 to one, and St. Louis down the Cubs in National League action 5-2. to two. Good morning. It's 62 degrees. I'm Dick Shire with Cozy's 8 o'clock Southwest Report. The planners for this Joe is joined on the hour and half hour from 6 till 9 a.m. by news director Dick Shire. Celebration in July. Dick heads up the largest radio news staff in Southwest Michigan providing coverage to over a dozen communities from St. Joseph to Paw Paw, South Haven to Kalamazoo. Cozy's staff meteorologists provide exclusive weather forecasting for this area. Behind your 81. Joe? The studio to your immediate left is Cozy's FM Master Control, where 95% of the station's programming originates. Next to it, on the right, is our AM control room. Cozy FM and AM are simulcast most of the time, which means the same programming is aired over each facility. Cozy FM at 98.3 and Cozy AM at 940 on the dial. We do, however, split the station's programming for several major features. Cozy is the exclusive voice of Detroit Tiger baseball in Allegan, Van Buren, Berrien, and Cass Counties. Cozy FM carries all nighttime Tiger games and boasts listenership as far away as South Bend, Indiana. Tiger daytime games are carried on our AM station at 940 on the dial. Each weekday morning at 835, right after Paul Harvey News and Comment, our FM and AM stations split programming, and News Director Dick Shire hosts The Breakfast Club, a talk show program which features guests ranging from local service organizations to Midwest celebrities to state senators and representatives. After 9 a.m. each morning, Cozy turns the operation over to our state-of-the-art computer-controlled automation system, allowing our staff personnel to coordinate public service and news functions and other station operations. This sophisticated automation system programs the station's music, weather, commercial advertising, and a variety of programming functions. Each individual cartridge tape, located in the six round carousels, is programmed the day prior to airing for the following day's broadcast schedule. Directly in front of you is the Cozy Newsroom, one of our key programming areas. Our newspeople step into the automation system each hour throughout the remainder of the day, taking control of the system to air live news, weather, and sports, and taking audio feeds from correspondents located throughout Cozy's four-county listening area. Cozy Radio is Van Buren County's designated emergency broadcast radio station. Our 24-hour operation allows us to keep tabs on emergency weather conditions, such as tornado warnings and severe winter storms, which sometimes leave hundreds of travelers stranded along the major interstates passing throughout the area. We also have direct communication and a warning system with the nuclear power plant in our area, Palisades, located seven miles down the coast of Lake Michigan. In the studio to the right of the Cozy News Center is the first of two production facilities where most of our advertisers' commercial ads are recorded and produced. Many of our advertisers record their own commercials for a one-on-one -on -one approach to prospective customers. And if you'd like to hear what you'd sound like on the radio, we'll tell you how you can do that in just a moment. Finally, I'm here in the one studio you can't see from your vantage point, the second of our twin commercial recording studios. This is where Cozy's unique soft contemporary music format is mastered on four-track tape decks from high-quality vinyl discs and compact discs. We've chosen this type of music format since it appeals to the widest possible age group in this area. Some of our more sophisticated commercial advertising is also recorded in this studio. A moment ago, we mentioned you can hear how you sound on the radio. Now, we posted our current recording times here. Just be there during those times, and we'd be more than happy to record you. And don't forget, you can bring your children also.
We'll record you and them on a short commercial, mix their voice with their favorite music, and then play it back for you to hear. You can even purchase the cassette for a souvenir if you like. Along with your I Was On Cozy Radio t-shirt, you'll also note on each side of the wine barrel viewing rooms monitor switches. They allow you to tune in to the various studios we've just described and hear what's actually going out over the air. In case you were wondering, the second level of our building houses our administrative, bookkeeping, and sales offices, along with our record library. On the roof are the various satellite dishes which bring the ABC radio network into our studios, along with the Tiger Baseball Network and the Michigan News Network. There you have it. Cozy FM and AM, the most listened to radio stations in Van Buren and Northern Berrien counties. Now, we'd like to invite you into our wine tasting room, where our winery personnel will take you through a tasting experience of our award-winning Fen Valley wines, produced right here in Southwest Michigan. They'll also be happy to explain how it is that Cozy became the world's only radio station located in a winery. Or is it the world's only winery located in a radio station? Well, whichever. We're glad you came. We hope you'll come back and see us soon. Um, we built this beautiful winery that just, for several years, it did very, very well. South Haven had experienced a, a real dip in tourism in the, oh, it must have been the early 90s, so we scrapped the project, and, but it was fun. It yeah, was a, now it was you'd a, have to start a, a brewery. That's Jeez. right. Yeah. Now, now you could. We build it as uh, the world's only radio station in a winery, or is it the only winery in a radio station? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, I've yeah. never heard of it before. That was the first yeah. for me when you told me. So. It was, it was, it was, it was fun. You yeah. know, and the kids help you know work in it, and some of the people that worked at the station would take shifts in the winery. You know, and we signed the FM on. Uh, the first thing to be broadcast, I came on and I said, "Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to Cozy FM." I'm going to start to get a little emotional. Yeah. Uh, here's Paul Harvey. Well, we had Paul Harvey. We had Detroit Tiger Baseball. We yeah. had just a real good, uh, soft adult format. Not quite MOR, but we did that. We, we appealed to a lot of people. Right. Uh, but we had a, a format of, you know, that was well executed, just uh, of, of soft rock. Um, and we had that station from... October 1st, uh, or let's say August 1st of 1981 until April sometime 1996. So we had a little over 15 years. Uh -huh. Well, that took some remembering. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I haven't thought about that but in a while. That was kind of the last station, wasn't it? Then you That's went into the last the... time that I worked in radio. Yeah. yeah. So. Last time I was on a microphone until I started doing commercials for somebody that has a <laughs> client or two in the Whitehall area. Yeah, there you go. Yeah. <laughs> But yeah, I had, I don't know, what I have, 30, 35 years in the business and uh, loved almost every minute of it. Yeah. Oh. There is one story we did forget to talk about. What's that? Though. Uh, well, I'm sure it's more than that, but the one that uh, you know, cause because you were you were there and you were part of it, was the alley-oop story at TRU. Oh, my God. Because <laughs> everybody heard about it, but nobody nobody was actually there like you. You were actually there. I was there. I had a small part in it. Um Skip Knight came up with the idea to play this outrageous record nonstop. Uh, Bill Trapp would go on the air when the record hit number one. I'm pretty sure it peaked at one. Yeah. And he'd say, i got to play this record again. I hate this record, but they tell me i got to play it. And hell, you poop. You know, the record yeah. would start. Yeah. And he'd, he'd, he, sometimes he'd take the needle off and he'd go to another song and people would call and complain. And that was, he was getting, you know, uh, a lot of uh, uh, PR from it, bad PR mostly. <laughs> yeah. Um, anyway, they came up with this promotion, uh, put Bill Trapp in a loincloth on the roof of the TRU studios. Those studios, before they, before they were turned down, were flat. So I helped carry some of the equipment. Now, I'm a, I'm a junior in high school. Okay. This was done during the summer of my junior year, between junior and senior year at Muskegon High School. We had moved from the south to Muskegon in the, um, just after the, the last semester of my junior year, I think it was. And it's another story how I got out to True, but Franklin Poling was uh, instrumental in that. Ray Hozier was instrumental in it, and Fred Tascone was instrumental in it. Anyway, I was a kid hanging around the studios. 
and they said, hey, you want to you want to help us with this promotion? What do you want me to do? Well, we need to bring a record player <laughs> and a microphone and so forth to the roof. Oh, my. What is going to go on? Uh, and then maybe the other thing is Bill probably needs something to drink to keep his whistle wet. <laughs> I said, okay. Deli- so, you, so you were a delivery boy before you were so, a radio guy. So, okay. So <laughs> the whole afternoon and early evening, I had to lug six packs of, I can't remember his favorite beer, but Bill loved his beer. Yeah. But that was my claim to fame with the Alley Oop. And we, sh- we could do a whole half hour segment on that, I think, because it was the most fantastic radio station promotion to this day. Yeah. Nobody in this market has touched it. Well, see, yeah, there you go. You're part of history right there because I, you were you I were guess, part of that whole I thing. I guess so. Yep. Bringing beer up to them. <laughs> <laughs> do you remember? Do you remember the flavor? What kind of beer it was? And that's or? what I said. I'm trying to think. I, Hams, the beer refreshing. Hams. Yes. Oh, yeah. It maybe yeah. wasn't out of Chicago, but that's where I remember seeing the commercials. I think Bill was the Hams guy with the, the little guy. beavers beating their tails on the yeah, log. Yeah, you know? Yeah. 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 I forgot about I, Hams. I, I, I think it was Hams. <laughs> I, I was very happy with uh, uh, the people must have learned something working at our stations because so many of them went on to bigger and better things. Uh, John Leader, do you remember that name? No. John Leader was known on R&R, the radio and records program, as Dr. John Leader, real name John Alfinito. Father was a physician in Grand Rapids. He was our midday announcer at WGRD AM in the late 60s. Uh, John ended up at KHJ. John was the voice. John, for a number of years, did the opening voice for Survivor. John's on a bunch of stuff. He, you know, Okay, pe- the Survivor, the, Survivor television the TV show. show. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. He's not doing that anymore, I don't think, but he's a big voiceover talent in the uh, uh, L.A. market and, yeah. of course, all over the country. So that's that's kind of the neat thing about, you know... How come you never that, got into that? I mean, you got a great voice. How come you never got into the... Because it took 24-plus hours a day to run my own station. No, I understand that. But, yeah. I mean, after the station, I mean, I understand because, you know, you were running a... Because we went into a whole different... A whole different avenue, yeah. Yes, yeah. yes. We built a deer ranch, <laughs> which is another story. <laughs> and that's not Deer Park Funland. We're it's not, not talking Deer that. Park, no. no. It yeah. was a fun place, too. But uh, we yeah. were in that for 15 years. We owned our own station for 15. And you get to the point where that's enough. Yeah. That's yeah. enough. Okay. Well, the theater of the mind is Radio Wiz. Yeah. Uh, and talking about what we were going to do on the air, you could really create some. Oh, yeah. Fun. Yeah. Best promotion, I think, or one of the best, uh, we did in Grand Rapids was the uh, Corvette giveaway. If you answered your telephone, WGRD, don't say hello, say WGRD and win a silver edition anniversary Corvette. Mm-hmm. It was a silver 25th anniversary, 1979. I think, isn't that Corvette came out in 54? So that would be 64, 70, 79. All you had to do was answer your phone, WGRD. And it was the most fantastic promotion that anybody had come up with, at least in that market. Yeah. Everybody, I mean, literally, you'd call people on the phone and they'd say WGRD. Now, w- and, uh, WGRD, of course, was a Grand, Grand Rapids station, but how far yeah, did, it, did, did it Grand reach Rapids, Did it right. reach Muskegon at all? Oh, sure. Same okay. It I thought today. it did. I was, I was wondering if it did, yeah. Yep. Same, same as it does today. It became very popular over here. Okay. One of the things that probably gave true problem, uh, problems back in the day. Yeah, because I it was a it was a fantastic promotion that, uh, as I say, people all over the west part of, of Michigan, over here by the lake and in Grand Rapids, <laughs> answered our phone WGRD. Yeah. Finally, and of course, the thing with a promotion like that that you never know, and the chance you take is somebody could have answered GRD on their phone the first week, the first day, the second week, the third week. It went on for, I think it was like two and a half or three weeks. Wow, that's pretty good. One day I'm down in the production room, which was on the lower level of the station, and I was I was just coming up the stairs to go up to the offices and where the control room was, and whoever was on the air, and I can't remember for the life of me, doing afternoon drive at the time. It could have been uh, Johnny Walker, could have been uh, Sean Stevens, somebody is... 
they, they come out of the control and say, what do I do? What do I do? So we look back, Ron White and I were together. What do you mean? What do you do? Something break in the control room? You know, the turntable? No, I got a guy on the phone. Just answer the phone. GRD. What do I do? <laughs> we looked at each other and said, give him the Corvette. <laughs> <laughs> But he was so shaken that the jock that was on the air, he just, you know, the giveaway, uh, I don't remember what they cost back in the day, probably 30000 Oh, yeah, probably. Was. Yeah. Uh, it was just fantastic. But it had everybody in the market uh, talking about uh, the radio station. What, what do you got to tell me today there, sir? I heard oh, you got some inter interesting information. You were talking about, uh, you mentioned the Getty Drive-In. Right next door, of course, were our true studios. And I thought of a promotion that we did that was... It was fun, but it was taxing. It was it was probably one of the better ones over a couple of years span that we had at True, but it was called the True Bob Moore Honduro. Okay. You may recall Bob Moore Honda right. was a Honda. Um, I almost said, this is too early in the morning. I almost said submarine business. <laughs> <laughs> Bob Moore Honda, and they had, you know, Honda motorcycles, and they had another brand of snowmobiles, I remember, because I used to call on them uh, in sales. Okay. And I would sell them a package of a giant Easter Bunny or a giant Santa Claus. And, of course, the, the package had commercial spots on the air, and, and uh, it had a box to register, and we'd set those things up uh, and have them drive the snowmobile or have them drive the Honda, you know, during the course and people would come in and register. That's not what I was going to talk about. Uh, somebody at true came up with it. I don't, I think it was probably Tom shine before I handled the account. Tom was a, uh, a fantastic sales rep that we had at true who was later promoted to our sister station, W O L F out in Binghamton, New York. So I'm pretty sure that Tom came up with this with, uh, with the folks at Bob Moore. And it revolved literally around a race in which a little Honda motorcycle, motorbike, received about a quarter of a tank of gas. And the true disc jockeys got on their Hondas and we raced around a course. I think, it, do you remember the Westgate Shopping Center? No, no, I don't, I don't remember. That was probably before me. <laughs> That may not be the name of it. I, I really can't remember where. It was somewhere out by, by Meyer Thrifty Acres, Norton and and um, Seminole Drive in Muskegon, Norton and Henry, actually, uh, back in those days. I think it was next to them. or Anyway, it was the Westgate Shopping Center, as I recall. And we had a little course marked out with pylons in a circle. And... <laughs> Are these, little, are these those little Honda 50s, those little tiny things? Yeah. Oh, well, well, no, they were actually, no, they were the little larger version. They might have been the 125. Oh, okay. All right. That's not too bad. I could, I just picturing you on one of those little Honda 50s. That they are about like four inches from the ground. <laughs> anyway, that, that go ahead. Would have, that would have been more visually yeah. uh, exciting, I think. Yeah. <laughs> but this was radio. But anyway, we, um, we had this, this promotion. Uh, where the disc jockeys got on their Hondas and people had to guess who the winner would be and what time he would run out of gas. So we all got out there in our tuxedos. Now you, oh, I've got geez. a picture of myself in it. We had tuxedos. I had a baby blue tuxedo. And we got out there about <laughs> noon and started this Honduro. And of course we gave it all kinds of promotion on the air and we had a huge crowd out there to, to see the, the beginning of it. We thought that it would go probably an hour, maybe two hours at the most. We, yeah. wanted, it to, we wanted it to end maybe one, two o'clock at that particular time. And of course we were broadcasting this thing on the air with cut-ins. You know, here comes uh, skip night around the far corner and Skip looks like he's about ready to drop. Maybe his Honda, his Honda, his Honda's telling him something. You know that crazy stuff like that. Yeah. Tom was doing. Tom was doing the narration. I think. So we got on these things about noon, and if you can imagine riding around and around and around, you get sort of cat cataclysmic. You, you know, you go into a state, a comatose state, which is kind of dangerous because you'll tip one of these things. We weren't going that fast. The object was just to, you know, burn the gas and go around and around and 
People were coming out watching. I don't think they were throwing anything at us, but it was one of those types of things. You know, just, <laughs> I would have been if I was if I, I was alive then. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> it was it was just a, you know a fun Saturday afternoon type of thing. Yeah, the station they promoted the daylights out of, and and uh, and it worked. The only problem was we had totally miscalculated what a great miles per gallon. Oh yeah, things got. Yeah. So one o'clock came and we're still racing around, you know, and riding and right. And we'd have, I think every hour we had like a 10 minute break and we'd have one of the, the other people, a sales rep or part-time disc jockey, that type of thing. They'd, they'd get on the thing and run it around for us for about 15, 10, 15 minutes. So we, we did get a break and it was a good thing that Bill Trapp wasn't riding around them because then we would have had big D Drewies or Ham's beer for a sponsor, you know, but <laughs> And that could have been dangerous, but yeah, well, uh, no, you know. I'm just, I'm just kidding. Bill was, you know, as you know, I, he's one of the best guys in the business. So one o'clock came and we're still going round and round and round. Two o'clock came and we're going round and round and round and three o'clock. By this time, we're beginning to get blisters in a certain portion of our anatomy. Yeah. Yeah. And it was really getting to the point where going around in circles like this is pretty good. It's a big oval course, as I recall. But still, you you lose your train of thought. You you lose your your. I don't know what the word would be. Well, I'm sure your uh, tidy whities were probably going up your butt. But anyway, yeah, go ahead. <laughs> I wasn't going to get that gross, but he, you're absolutely <laughs> correct. So, two o'clock, three o'clock, four o'clock, and we're still writing these damn things. And and now it's getting to the point where we're thinking, gee, this is absolutely. The crowd had dwindled. You know, and yeah. what are we doing this for? Yeah. So I think. Kind of like think watching about, NASCAR. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> so I think it must have been about 4.30, quarter to five, five o'clock, something like that. Somebody sputtered. And the, the people who were riding, it was Skip Knight. It was myself and Bob Klein, who was our midday uh, DJ at the time. I think it was just the three of us. Yeah, And then people like Jeff Ladd, who was a part-time announcer at the time. Uh, I don't remember if Sandy Dune. Now, that's a great radio name. Oh, yeah. West Michigan on the lake. Sandy Dune. Uh, he, was, he was doing Six to Midnight. Uh, but these people would come in, give us a break, and so forth. That, that helped a whole bunch. But we didn't know what to do. Finally, about, like I say, 4.30, quarter to 5, as I recall, one of them started to sputter. And finally ran out of gas. Huh. Oh, thank God this is finally coming to an end. Then another one stopped. Well, that left me writing. Oh, so you're the winner. Well, what I found out is somebody had spiked my gas tank. (laughs) And instead of giving me a quarter gallon, whatever, they gave me probably, you know, like, like a little less than half a gallon. And I went and went and went. Well, we had the dance to do in Grand Haven that night. So it became a matter of, i got to burn this gas out. So I was looking around for maybe some kind of a turkey baster. I could siphon off the gas or whatever. But about 6 o'clock, 6.30, I don't know, somewhere in that neighborhood, I finally sputtered and ran out of gas. And I'm talking about physically, mentally, and the Honda. Yeah. And then uh, we drew the name, found out, you know, mm-hmm. back at the station on Monday, and announced the big winner, and it was just, it was a great promotion. It was just you know, a lot of fun, but it didn't quite work out as was supposed to. And back one then? Of things, one of those things you can't plan for. Back then, gas was like, what, 25 cents a gallon? <laughs> exactly. It might, yeah. It might have been 26, 27 yeah, cents. So yeah. the, that was the true Bob Moore Honduro, a lot of fun. Yeah. Good so, promotion. The promotion that I got to talk about because I, I you sent me a picture you got you got me joining a bunch of these uh, different things on Facebook here and uh, um, one of the things uh, was the WGRD as far as radio and stuff but there was a one promotion that you did for TRU right was a TRU that we're talking about so which promotion are you I, I have an idea that maybe I want to. Uh, right now. Well, you got that picture of you and those th- I think it's three women, and oh uh, yeah, and yeah, WTRU yeah. read a promotion of eligible bachelor at the time, and you were one of the eligible bachelors, and they would they bid on you or something? Did they have to bid on you or what? Well, how did they- you know? Here we're talking about getting people to, to listen to your radio station and coming up with promotions. 
This did absolutely nothing. It was, and it's the most embarrassing thing I've ever done in my life, bar none. I was about to turn 21. I was a bachelor. I was doing afternoon drive on a top 40 radio station. And, you know, I, I had wonderful things to say about Fred Tascone when we talked uh, in our last interview. I think he may have come up with this. And for that, Fred, I rue the day that I ever met you. <laughs> <laughs> come on, those girls I saw in the picture, they didn't look too bad. Well, that wasn't the point. It was, what it was is. Because you didn't want to be a piece of meat? What? I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> I'm glad you, you speak your mind. I do. Yeah. That's my I problem. I think the way it worked, and I'm, I think I've tried to forget this over the years, is women had to, or girls had to, go to some of the various dress shops in town, hostlers or Hardee's or vets or, you know, you remember those? Oh, yeah. West Avenue. And I think they had to register there to get a chance to win a date with me. <laughs> okay. I mean, good grief. And how many and they did they came get? Out with this, I threatened to quit. I, I said, this is the most <laughs> ridiculous, asinine thing I've ever heard of. <laughs> and it, and it, it, it turned out to be more embarrassing than I ever thought. Any guys register? <laughs> <laughs> Not back then. Oh, okay, just check it. That, well, did I know of? Now, yeah, I don't know. Uh, I, I, what they they said that the three girls would win a date uh, with this handy Andy bachelor guy, <laughs> <laughs> and dinner would be at uh, Lakos on. Uh, oh on yeah, Street, on Henry. Yeah, and all expenses, of course, for the girls, and so what happened is. They drew the names, they notified the girls, and I don't remember. There were probably only three entries is what happened. But <laughs> I, I don't know, lucky we got three. Yeah. So because they did a little, you know, one of the neatest things about being on the radio. If you're this one a guy, dinner. This one a know, dinner. No, nobody knows what you look like. Yeah. They think, oh, man. This is, so, you know, I, I had to come out, come out from behind the microphone, which is very embarrassing. Right. No, so, I know. I know. I'm, I, I definitely have the face for radio. Believe me, I know yeah. all about it. Yeah. There you go. So they drew the names. I get all dressed up, you know, and somebody had picked up corsages for their gals. Did you wear the powder and blue suit? <laughs> did I what? Did you wear the powder blue suit? <laughs> I, don't, I honestly don't remember what I wore. <laughs> I'm sorry. <laughs> Except, and I digress here, you, that picture I sent you. Yeah. I think what well, I think one of them had I was in my Tommy Rowe coat. Oh, there you go. I got to introduce Tommy Rowe over at the um oh, what was the place in Grand Rapids that, that had all the concerts. G R D and L A V used to sponsor concerts there. I can't think of it right now. I know it wasn't was the Vet End though, because that wasn't even built then, but anyway. No, that wasn't even there. Yeah. Oh, geez, what was the name of that? I don't want to think about it while we're talking. But anyway, I got to introduce Tommy Rowe, and he had this really neat, checkered, black and white, um, not quite knee length overcoat. Okay. I said, I got to have one of those. So I had gone all over Grand Rapids, Muskegon. I finally found one somewhere. Uh, but that's what I was wearing in that coat. That's what I wore on the outside. What I wore underneath, I don't remember. What a stud. What a stud. <laughs> yeah, it could have been. <laughs> I doubt it was the powder blue because I didn't tell you that when that promotion ended, um, the uh, Honduro, the winner got a pie in the face. Oh, good. Yeah. And I, I did. And so I don't know if that, <laughs> if that tux made it through or I got a picture of that. I'll show you sometime. And that was before you had to go to the, uh, the, the, what, the grand thing in Grand Haven, the bash in Grand Haven, right? The dance? Or yeah. The, uh, Honduro? Yeah, that was. Yeah. 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 So anyway, this this was in uh, January of 1964. Okay. Uh, because the only reason I know that is because of that picture I sent you it has the date, date stamped yeah. out of yeah. yeah. So you can begin to p try to put all these things together. Yeah, so, the women they had those those their hair where they was pushed up to the ceiling kind of thing, <laughs> you know, the oh, buffon or whatever. They, yeah, beehive. Yeah, beehive. That's what they call them, right? Yeah. <laughs> My wife tells an interesting story where she and a couple girlfriends were going over to a dance or something, Hess Lake, I think she said. 
and they kind of got lost, I think, and went through not a stop sign or a barricade, but they went through some kind of a uh, something at the end of the road they weren't supposed to and ended up going down this bumpy country road full of potholes and water and mud and and the worst part about it is all the girls' beehives were compressed from bouncing on the ceiling of the car. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> they, were, yeah. they were just, you know, and my wife was, Arlene was driving. I guess, There's so no seatbelts back then either, so yeah. Well, that's right. Yeah. That's right. <laughs> so anyway, uh, digressing back to the corsages that they had provided, and somebody drove the van, I think it was probably Skip Knight, and we met at the station, Got in the van, went to the first girl's house, and I take this corsage and go in, and, and I had to meet the parents and make small talk, and it was just, oh my, I can't tell you how embarrassing it was. <laughs> so then we go to the second, we go to the third, and we get these three gals, they're very lovely ladies. Uh, we pick them up and go to, uh, as I said, Lakos on Henry Street. <laughs> we go to the table that we were to sit at. Yeah. And, and what had the station done, but they make this little stand up sign. It was, it was very poorly done. <laughs> it was <a> <laughs> sign. <laughs> poorly did match the, uh, match the guy they made it for. And it had the winter date with Don Anderson, three ladies and Don, I it had something like that. And it stood up about two feet above the table and everybody in the restaurant was coming around and making snide remarks. Oh, yeah. <laughs> well, Fred must have thought you were quite the man when he set you up with three ladies. I mean, come on. There you, here you go. Uh, it, but it, to put yourself in my spot. No. I mean, it, and, and to this day, I, I can remember, you know, how utterly embarrassing that was. But it turned out it was a nice dinner, and and uh, we had a good time and chit-chat. and yeah. We got, you, a, we got prime rib on the radio station for free. Did you get any numbers? Uh, that's another story. We'll leave that one. <laughs> we'll, we'll leave that one yeah, alone they, for now. Because you know, besides the beehives, they weren't bad looking ladies that there were you were there with. I mean, you could have they could have really set you up with some. You know. Anyway, we won't go there either. Oh you know boy! I I think the guys were trying to find the box that all the entries were. Yeah. At the station were. Fortunately, I think Fred Fred got rid of it. So, oh, so anyway, yeah. that was uh, and the night wrapped up, and we took them all home, and and that was it. But it was just terrible. So, did you have like a limousine or something to chauffeur you guys around, or did you drive? No, we, had, or? we had this old van that we used for the whole bank oh, highway. Oh, okay. Well, I'm glad you didn't try to <laughs> drive them all on your Honda, <laughs> on your Honda rather, your did little. You? Honda 125 you, or whatever. Yeah, right. Did you get what I said? It was for the Homemakers Highway? No, I didn't get it. Sorry. It went over, right over we my had, head. We had this old van. We didn't, I don't know, True didn't want to spring for a nice, all lettered up, you know, yeah. radio station type van. So we had this old van that uh, Skip would go around and he would talk to people on the Homemakers Highway. Well, he didn't have, he didn't have a mobile studio, so he recorded it. And then they would take it back and play it the next day during the midday, you know, right. or the more traditional housewife time, you know, nine to three. And he would play these interviews and wherever we stopped, people would call in to register to be on the Homemaker Highway. And uh, Homemaker stopped, Highway. The Homemaker Highway. Boy, that, that'd get you slapped today. But anyway, go ahead. Oh, my word. Yeah. yeah. But uh, – We'd stop and we'd give them prizes, you know, movie theater tickets and records and that type of thing, you know, and he'd bring the tape back and play it. This leads me to another embarrassing situation. Of course it does. <laughs> <laughs> I caught the Homemaker Highway one week mm. and Skip couldn't do it. So I was chosen to go out and, and do this, uh, this, this trip around Muskegon talking to, to ladies. One of the stops we made was at the Hackley School of Nursing. Hmm. I don't know how many people remember that, but there was a Hackley oh, yeah, School yeah. of Nursing. You remember that? Okay. They, well, they still got a picture up there in, in Hackley Hospital of the, all Do the they? nurses. Oh, yeah. Okay. So I get into the the nurses' place, quarters, or the school room, whatever you want to call it, and it was all set up with beds. And the beds were occupied by a nurse. 
Okay. And and the nurses had been practicing how to take care of a patient, evidently, when they are, you know, confined to their gurney or in the bed, that type of thing. And so I walk in and, well, I'm here to do the homemaker highway. And these gals are in bed and they all pull up the, the covers real tightly to their chin, you know, and here's this guy where he shouldn't be. Oh, so they, they were not in their right, their clothes at the time? <laughs> they were in these well, beds? evidently not, because <laughs> I went to... I went to Jan was her name, and I won't mention last names. Yeah. Uh, her sister, no, Jan set up the promotion. It was her sister Cheryl, who was in the bed. Ah. Now, if anybody knows these people, uh, my apologies, but I won't mention last names. Cheryl was in the bed, and she had the the, the covers pulled right up tight to her chin, and and I asked her a question, and I can't remember what it was, but. Something like, well, how do you do this procedure? And it called it called for her, you know, to demonstrate. And so she stood up, sat up, I should say, in the bed. Well, the cover fell off. Okay. She totally forgot that she had this this cover on her, and it fell off. Now, how do you explain that on the radio? That was the end of the interview. Okay, well, she she was nude. I take it then. Uh, pretty much so. Yeah. So you did when you were talking, just kind of how about a, how about a, how about a, <laughs> it was, I just, you know, it luckily it was recorded, moment. right? <laughs> this was all recorded. Yeah. yeah. I don't remember. I think they just cut that part out because I, it sure didn't air, but Oh my word, what do you do? Yeah. So you were pretty Red lucky. State. They set you up with in TRU days, set you up with three eligible, uh, um, women to uh to date and to get stake with and you go to a hospital and, and see you know nude women i mean i tell I you what think, man what a job you had were, i don't think they were totally nude as i think about it. i'm sure they had undergarments on <laughs> I don't, it was pretty in your hard. dream though they were totally nude i know oh, i know yeah <laughs> so those are a couple of <laughs> more embarrassing situations i had in my tenure at wtru yeah one of the greatest stations I ever worked at. It was so much fun. Oh yeah, that's, a, that's what I always go back to my my sunny FM days. Even though I was only I was only there for probably a little less than two years, because um, I was just part time there. Man, I tell you, they did some stuff that was so much fun. It was just it was just fun. And then you had so many. It was especially I can imagine back in the TRU days, you had so many listeners. That was the same way Sunny FM was when I was there. It was just tons of listeners, and they'd call you all the time, and you'd be on the phone all the time. I mean, it was just a just a, a ball to go to work. I remember that. Oh, yeah. 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 The request line at night was just uh, hopping. Just, and I'd turn the request line, usually open after 5 o'clock, because the office staff didn't want those phones ringing out. They We had to use the uh, the phones it was too cheap to, to get a dedicated line. So right. we used the regular station phone. I think we had one that rang. Really? <laughs> if you knew, if you saw that line ringing by itself, it was Fred or it was Skip and something had to be imparted to the disc jockey and not so favorably a manner. In other words, <laughs> screwed up. Yeah. <laughs> so, but, um, that was, we'd turn, I'd turn the lines open at 5 o'clock, usually 5.30, and my shift was done at 6, and then the nighttime guy carried on from there. Well, we had a break. We had sound off at 6 o'clock, 6.05 until 7. Skip would do sound off, and then 7 o'clock at night, we'd go into the uh, the evening show. Right. Yeah, it's, it, it's funny, though, all those old, <clears throat> I wonder what ever happened to all those old records of all those different shows that they used to have. Like, uh, you know, I remember at MUS when I used to run a lot of that uh those shows too, as far as the country shows that they would do with, you know, some of the great country stars back then, all those records, I think that it threw them all away. Didn't they? All that stuff. From, Are you talking about just the regular 45s we played? No, 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 no. The, 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 the shows that they used to produce, like the Casey Kasem's and all that stuff. They used oh, to be on okay. record, you know, way back then. I mean, what do they, he was on, I'm not sure when Case we ran Casey Kasem at GRD in Grand Rapids. I don't that, remember. That was probably satellite back true. then. Yeah. All those records got pitched. I wish yeah, I, yeah. I would. I'd give anything to have, like you say, this, this, the programs that came in produced on uh, vinyl. Yeah, and some of them tape. I remember Mark Mark Dixon one time showed me um, the room of all the LPs that they've saved from the MUS days for all the years that they used to play records. You know, mm. 
So, mm -hmm. I mean, it was just amazing. And they're all, you know, probably played once because they were put on cart. Songs are put on cart, you know. And, right, right. Pewed once. So. Oh, yeah. Yeah, so. I wish I had the the uh, Pam's Jingles that we had at True and at GRD. Those somehow, you know, I'm sure that with ownership change or format change, they sat in a drawer for a long time, and then all of a sudden people were throwing stuff away, and they they met the trash can. But yeah. it, it'd be so neat to have those uh those jingles. I don't even remember the numbers, number, number four, or number 12. Uh, the pans were all numbered and, uh, well, I just the like sound of box hangups and well, just like you had that old, that old uh, microphone that you had way back from, I don't know, TRU or G GRD. I'm not sure. Remember where you got it from the one I confiscated. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I mean, that was a great, great old microphone, you know, ribbon, That's the nice. ribbon microphone. The Yep, the type of microphone that uh, people like Arthur Godfrey. Yeah, yeah. Put and their, some of those would uh, cup their ear, <laughs> cup their ear, and yeah. talk on the mic. I never, I never could figure that out. I never did either. either. <laughs> and a lot, of, well, a lot of people now, even the singers. Yeah. It must, it must. Uh, so they can hear themselves, I guess. I guess I'm yeah. doing it right now, and it still sounds lousy. So I guess it doesn't. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, I, mean, I remember it when uh, when Grand Valley took over uh, WKBZ, and uh, they were just throwing stuff out left and right too. And it was like, man, I got some. I I, I could have got some really cool stuff, but I you know at mm -hmm. the time I didn't mm -hmm. think about it. But I did confiscate the one the one mic stand that said WKBZ on it. It was a you know cast iron mic stand with WKBZ, and I. I gave that to John Van White because he continued with WKBZ. So that was something I gave him. I guess he's going to put that in the uh, in the museum. So you know. oh, that's cool. Yeah, yeah. That's the that's the type of thing that uh, that happens when when stations are are sold. New owners come in yeah. and throw stuff out. When we sold our station in South Haven, fortunately, I managed to keep uh, most of, if not all, the forty fives. We wow. had a we had a pretty good forty five collection because we played a lot of the soft. Uh, late 50s, 60s, uh, and 70s. Not MOR, but some of the softer pop stuff that came out. Right. And in doing that, we collected a lot of the stuff that uh, was even more upbeat. Yeah, I mean, we'd I, go down. My wife and I would spend. We'd go down to Chicago for a shopping weekend, and we we hit up. I can't remember the name of the records. Was it Johnny's Record Store in Chicago or something like that? Just fabulous. You'd walk into this this store, plate glass all the way around, the windows. And you walk in, it'd be nothing but vinyl. Yeah. It's just thousands of, of, of probably square feet of vinyl. And that's what we would do. We would shop for certain titles, you know, and we'd come back and I'd have maybe 15, 20 titles to add to. And then uh, our operations guy would take and transfer them to tape. And that's how we accomplished that in the early days of our, oh, yeah. and that's back in 1981, 82, 83, we did that before right. we bought syndicated. So. Right. Yeah. It's what, um, there, you know, there's, there's been a few nice record stores here in the in Muskegon. Uh, I remember the records and more. I don't know if you remember that they became CDs and more. Or anyway, they finally went out of business, but um, they were records and more, and they had all the records. And <clears throat> I remember I sold <clears throat> during hard times. Excuse me, during hard times, I kind of sold some of my great records to them. I remember, and uh, but they were very picky about it too, as far as you know, used records and stuff. But uh, mm -hmm. but there's a used record store here that I'm I'm kind of reclaiming my old LP collection from over at Groove Groove Record Shop, which of course is closed right now. But uh, you know, maybe when they open up again I can continue on that. So I always thought that I'd uh, I never, never was able to to this day. I'd like to get a big old Wurlitzer. Or what was the other brand of um uh the big record players that you find in in bars and candy stores, you know that oh you know you, the about? old jukebox you mean or Yeah the jukebox. Yeah. That's I uh, always wanted one of those. I always thought that I'd take this collection that I have and put them into that Wurlitzer. But I find out now they're making Wurlitzer uh, reproductions yeah. to play CDs. That's no fun. No, that's no fun. <laughs> you can't yeah. see the record coming out and dropping onto the turntable and then the needle coming over and playing. Yeah, the, you know? the, especially the back then with the, the old jukeboxes, the needles weight, they're the arms of the knee and with the needles, they weighed about 10 pounds and the needles look like spike nails but anyway yeah <laughs> yeah yep. so those 45s will wear out pretty quickly but anyway but it's an interesting business as we both know and the the, the things behind the scene are what make it even more interesting and 
uh, and the different things, how you plan to do the promotions and right. what works and what doesn't. You know, they don't all work as you want them to. That's kind of right. like the Honduro. <laughs> right. Nobody can say that we didn't have fun in radio. That's for sure. There you go. So There you go. Nothing better. I mean, you don't get paid much, but uh, hey, you have fun. So, well, d- uh, sir, um, good luck on your grocery hunting. Yeah, we're still looking for more toilet paper. So if anybody has, let me give a phone number. No, I won't. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> Call Andy, Andy. <laughs> Thank you, Oscar. It's been real. Yeah, that is always that's always real when I talk to you, man. When we always go real on forever. Is- who knows Real if anybody listens to us, but hey, Real we, embarrassing. That's yeah, what it's we have fun anyway. So yeah, that's for sure. That's all that matters. It. It's, it's fun talking to you. Talking Same with you. All right, buddy. You take care. Okay. Thanks, Oscar. Yep. It's been fun. Bye. It's been fun. Bye. All right, boss. You got enough? Just enough? Are we done yet? Huh? Okay. We done yet? I mean, who's listening to this? Okay, boss. That's all she wrote for today. Bye. There you go, Oscar. Guaranteed to attract, um, nobody. There, we done? You want to pass me the alley-oop record? The loincloth, too?